In the late 19th century, the Europeans had taken over a great deal of North Africa, while over in the Palestine, there was another type of colonisation going on. But first, it's important to say what was happening in the region. An often cited description of the land comes from Mark Twain who visited in the 1860s. He said about his journey to Jerusalem, There are two or three small clusters of Bedouin tents, but not a single permanent habitation. Of all the lands there are for dismal scenery, I think Palestine must be the prince. There was hardly a tree or shrub anywhere. Even the olive tree and the cactus, those fast friends of worthless soil, had almost deserted the country. There could be a few reasons for Palestine being like this, like Bedouin raids which I'll get onto later, but others like Felix Beauvais blamed the Turks for the problem, saying, they have made a desert of it, where it is scarcely possible to walk without fear. And a couple of decades later, Reverend W.J. Starcy wrote an article called The Desolation of Palestine. The towns are filthy in the extreme, none more so than Jerusalem itself. He again blames the Ottoman authorities for this, saying, Everything is taxed. Every fruit tree, so now none are planted. Every cow or horse, every vegetable sold out of a private garden. Every eighth egg is not taxed, but taken by the government. And people would also be reluctant to have farmhouses, because they would be responsible for giving soldiers lodging at their own expense. While, nothing is done for the good or improvement of the people or the land by the government. However, this is a controversial issue, obviously given the current situation. And just to give the counter-argument, much of the region is still desert today, and some of the writers seem to have had other motives. Christians especially were looking at some form of colonisation. As the Reverend says in the same article, the whole revenue is stated to amount only £180,000. If it was six or even ten million, what would that be for Europe to raise for the purchase of Palestine? Yet, if this number is to be believed, the entire revenue generated in Palestine would have been much less than the annual income of the Duke of Devonshire at that time. And this was a period in which he, like many lords, were going through financial difficulties. So, Ottoman governors did just begin selling huge chunks of lands, like the Jezreel Valley, to the Greek Sersok family to generate some sort of income. Whatever you decide the reasoning behind these descriptions are, will probably be based on your political allegiance though. Nevertheless, the population was incredibly rural, as Jerusalem only had around 15,000 people in it in 1872. What percent of those people were Jewish is open for debate, but it was usually reported as anywhere between a third or a half. 15,000 people in a city for that time is still remarkably small, but it's not altogether unique for the empire. Many once great cities had largely been abandoned. Like when the Greeks achieved their independence, they found Athens, their new capital, only had around 5,000 people inside of it. Or there's the Bulgarian capital of Sofia. Their population declined to around 12,000 people in 1878. Or Tirana, the capital of Albania, only had 10,000 people throughout all of the 19th century. Some cities were obviously still very large, like Istanbul had over 700,000 people, and Cairo had around 500,000. Other important cities like Mecca had 40,000 people in it in the 1880s, but as it's in the desert, that sort of makes sense. Baghdad, Beirut and Damascus had growing populations, but still only around 100,000 people. This may sound impressive when compared to Jerusalem, but this still made them smaller or equal to cities like Danzig or Bremen in Germany, or in the UK, they'd be comparable to Sunderland, Nottingham, Oldham, Bolton and Blackburn. The English city of Newcastle was 10 times the size of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem had fewer people in it than Springfield, Illinois, which only built their first log cabin in the 1820s. It was roughly half the size of the Italian city of Verona before the Black Death, or for this time period, it could be compared to the Russian city of Tobolsk over in Siberia. Other cities in the region were even smaller, like Jaffa and Haifa only had around 5,000 people each. But these cities did begin to grow at the end of the century, as between 1882 and 1903, larger waves of Jewish people began arriving as part of the first Aliyah. The Zionist movement had been growing in popularity in Europe, but immigration to Israel really began increasing due to Russian pogroms. These new arrivals doubled the Jewish population in Palestine, and they created new towns like Rishon Lezion and Mikveh Israel, which were largely funded by the Rothschilds. There had also been a movement of Jews within Islamic lands already though. Like in Persia in Mashhad, there was a pogrom in 1839, and forced conversions. In Aleppo, blood libel cases forced many to flee, while in Baghdad, 
the old governor Dawood Pasha persecuted many, and plague in the 1830s drove many more out. In fact, before this it was reported in Baghdad, Jews are the governing element of the place. They have their stored booths in every bazaar, occupy all principal caravansaries, and entirely control the business of bankerage and monopolies. Some Jews though went in completely the opposite direction, like David Sassoon left Iraq and became a leader of the Jewish community in India. Yet largely many of the Jews from Syria, Persia and Kurdistan went to Jerusalem. They were also joined by many Yemeni Jews as well. However, their reason for migration was a little bit different. One member of the Sassoon family reported, In all ages there have been pretenders and false messiahs amongst Jews, but in Yemen they had been very numerous. No doubt because the Yemen Jew is credulous and lacks erudition. Shuka Kuhail I managed to gain a huge following and claim to be the messiah, before being killed by Arabs in 1865. But Judah ben Shalom took over his movement, and there would be others who continued preaching the end of the world was near. Mix this in with the arrival of Ottoman forces in the region, and around 10% of Jews left Yemen to Jerusalem beginning in 1881. But they weren't the only religious groups arriving. Again in 1881, a group of American Christians arrived hoping to create a utopian society. Many Swedish Protestants joined them, and they created an entirely communal colony, working alongside Muslims and Jews of the city. So largely it was a pretty peaceful addition to the city. There were earlier American groups that came to Palestine, like the Mormons under George J. Adams, who claimed to be the Messiah, but their colony at Jaffa failed. Then a group of Germans who also believed that the world was coming to an end, arrived in the region in the late 19th century. Their German Templar colonies had around 2,000 people, and they were pretty instrumental in developing important cities today like Haifa and Jaffa. And this colony came to the world's attention when, in 1898, Kaiser Wilhelm came to visit. This trip was important for many people, and the course of history going forward. For starters, Theodore Herzl met with the Kaiser, and the Kaiser agreed to put forward the idea of a Jewish state in front of the Sultan. In fact, Herzl even had ideas of asking for German protection for such a state. In fact, in 1896, Herzl wrote in Der Judenstaat, If His Majesty the Sultan were to give us Palestine, we could in return undertake to regulate the whole finances of Turkey. We should form there part of a wall of defence for Europe and Asia, an outpost for civilization against barbarism. All of this came after the Zionists held their first congress in Basel, where they picked Palestine as the future home of a Jewish state. This may sound obvious, but there were plans to create a Jewish state elsewhere beforehand, like in Uganda. By the fifth congress, they had set up the Jewish National Fund to begin purchasing more land in Palestine. The Olive Tree Fund in blue charity boxes and homes encouraged Jews in Europe to finance agricultural projects in Palestine, and they played an instrumental role in the founding of Tel Aviv. Later on, during the Second Aliyah in the early 20th century, the Jews would form their own militias, like the Bar Giora. Many of those who joined had served in underground cells opposed to the Tsar, and they brought that experience to the Levant. Yet, as the pogroms in Russia intensified, many more Jews began arriving in Palestine. Plus, many of these settlers joined in the kibbutz movement, which looked to create productive farmland, and, ideally, to create self-sufficient colonies. They were also joined, strangely, by Marxist Zionists, like Poali Zion, which had groups all over the world. There were, of course, many people, obviously, opposed to Zionism within the empire, but some of the most prominent Palestinian opponents included Christians, like Isa El Isa. He would go on to found a newspaper called Philistine, and there he argued that Zionism was a challenge to the Arab population for which he belonged. So just like in Lebanon, many of the early advocates of Arab nationalism and identity were Christians. But going back to the Kaiser's trip, it also inspired many Germans to acquire more territory in the Holy Land, and the Kaiser declared, May the Sultan rest assured, and the 300 million Mohammedans scattered all over the globe, and revering in him their caliph, that the German Emperor will be and remain at all times their friend. The Kaiser was therefore quite keen on Islam. As he said when leaving the Levant, My personal feeling in leaving the Holy City was that I felt profoundly ashamed before the Muslims, and that if I had come there without any religion at all, I certainly would have turned Mohammedan. Across the Islamic world, people began to believe that the Kaiser had in fact converted, and would become a saviour of the religion. Like Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, an Indian Muslim, wrote a book in which he said, 
even the Emperor of Germany has talked of relinquishing his faith. This proves that it is God Almighty's will that the Christian faith be obliterated from the face of the earth through rational arguments. During World War I, this idea would be central to many propaganda campaigns, as his diplomats would refer to him as Haji Wilhelm when trying to unite the Islamic world against the British and French. The Kaiser, however, was not always particularly consistent in his schemes though. As he later declared, be careful that the partition isn't implemented without us. I shall take Mesopotamia, Alexandretta, Mersina. The perceptive Turks are already patiently awaiting his fate. He continued he should wait until we have consolidated our position in our zones of activity there and are ready to annex. So the Ottomans should be seen only as a temporary ally until German settlers increased and he would claim lands later on. Importantly, it is also around this time that the Germans began construction on the Baghdad Berlin Railway. There had already been plans to construct the lines to exploit the resources of the empire like zinc, lead and possibly oil, but as of yet, no oil had been discovered. Some experts in the 1870s believed it could be found in Iraq, but there was no infrastructure in place to extract it, even if it was discovered. So in 1888, German investors helped begin the construction of a train line from Baghdad to Constantinople, linking up the many small existing lines in place. Other nations did also look to gain further concessions to build lines into Baghdad, but they were rejected. For instance, the Ottomans rejected a Russian bid because obviously they feared Russian expansion. The Germans, on the other hand, seemed to be a somewhat neutral power, with no colonies in the region. In return for warming relations with the Germans, the Sultan was expected to help the Kaiser abroad. Like when many Chinese Muslims rose up in Beijing during the Boxer Rebellion, the Sultan told the Muslims to stand down and not fight against the Europeans. Yet, German assistance did help the Ottomans actually reclaim a bit of land. Although their control over the Balkans weakened again after the Bulgarians united in the 1880s, in 1897 the Greeks in Crete rose up, hoping to become part of Greece. The Greeks marched into Turkish lands to support them, but the Ottomans actually prevailed. Their victory demonstrated they were becoming a modern fighting force, and this was largely down to the work of Kalmar Freer von der Goltz, other German officers, and, of course, numerical superiority. So all was not lost in the Balkans, and many pan-Islamists celebrated this victory. However, within the empire, they were once again losing control over their lands. Like in 1889 in Lebanon and Syria, a revolt broke out. This was called the Emir, and it was altogether quite small. The aims of the rebels were also remarkably specific, as they hoped to end the abuses of local sheikhs and partition up communal lands more equally. And in the end, the rebels were actually quite successful. But in the aftermath of this rebellion, the French and the Germans made an agreement to share in the construction of railroads in the region. These would spread from the coast deep into Syria, roughly around the lands that the French would later claim after World War I. And it's also important to say that sheikhs and tribal leaders did still exist, despite the Tanzimat reforms. Like in Lebanon, the Alatrash family continued to dominate. And you can use their history as a sort of marker of how divided these lands still were. They ruled around Jabal Hauran, which today is actually in Syria. A man named Ibrahim took over the family in 1869 and fought against his brother for control. But each tribe picked sides in the conflict, like Ibrahim launched an assault against the Al Hamdan clan. They were Druze, but they were still contenders for power. The Ottomans also looked to crush the power of the Alat Trash. Like in 1878, they appointed Mitdat Pasha to govern Damascus. He launched expeditions into Druze lands demanded a change of leaders and compensation be paid. At the same time, Muslims killed a couple of Druze men, the Druze then responded by massacring around 100 Muslims, and then the new Ottoman governor, Hamdi Pasha, responded by demanding blood money be paid, and Ottoman troops were garrisoned nearby. There were also a number of tribal conflicts as well, like in 1887, the Salut tribe rose up before the Ottoman sent in soldiers to crush them. And during the Amaya, peasant revolt spread into Lebanon. The Alatrash family fled to Damascus and were actually later restored by the Ottomans. But there were conditions this time, like they would have to implement the Ottomans' agrarian reforms and allow for the sale of land. But the Europeans could exploit this and expand their own influence in Lebanon. Shibli took over from his father in the 1890s, but again the region was incredibly volatile. The Ottomans formed an alliance with the Arab Ruwala tribe and they began to raid Lebanese territories. So Shibli formed his own alliance with the Bani Sakir. 
These two sides clashed with one another in small villages and in the desert until Shibli was arrested. His brother assaulted Ottoman barracks to try and free him, but this failed and they were then stripped of their power. This sort of thing though was going on across the whole Middle East. Like among the Ruwala, Al-Shalan killed his own brother and took power a couple years later. He would then occupy al juaf and play an important role in the Arab revolt. Or then there were the Bani Saqiyah. They were led by Fendi al-Fayez throughout much of the 19th century, and he defended the tribe against raids led by both Damascus and the Ruwala. By the late 19th century, it's estimated they had around 5,000 fighting men, launching their own raids on nearby lands. Like one British man named Henry B. Tristam, reported that when they arrived in the Gore Valley in Jordan, in a week there was not a green blade to be seen, where before the arrival of these locusts, one stood knee deep in rank herbage. So the arrival of these tribes across the region brought destruction of farmland. Like in 1870, T. Drake visited the Jezreel Valley and found that the Anisa tribe had left the region plundered, and only around one fifth of cultivated land was being used. Their camels would fill the valleys eating whatever crops they could, and then carry back plundered goods. You can find numerous reports just about every year of some village being destroyed and their fields laid to waste. Like the Tiaha tribe destroyed the villages of Sanabra and Deir Nahas, or in 1900, tribes raided the village of Yatta near to Hebron. Even Herbert Kitchener explored Palestine late in the century and remarked on the damage that took place as fields were destroyed, livestock was pillaged, and people were slaughtered. He was also unable to travel to many places, as the Tarabin and Tiaha tribes were at war with one another, so roads were closed. Back to the Bani Sakia though. Fendi was contracted by the Ottomans to protect pilgrims, which he did, and he grew immensely wealthy in doing so. His son Satam al-Fayez took over the tribe, and strangely, he was involved in another crisis that shows how volatile the region was. Henry B. Tristam, while exploring Palestine, was imprisoned in Karak Castle by the Majalis, a nearby tribe. Well, Satam was able to help Tristam by pressuring the Majalis to release him. With all of this going on, the Ottomans in places like Jordan tried to create a sedentary population, and it's here that they sent Circassian refugees to inhabit Amman in 1878. This today is the capital of Jordan, but for centuries it was largely uninhabited, only been used by seasonal farmers and the occasional Bedouin raider. As Salt was actually the more dominant city in Jordan, but this city was also divided into clans, like the Akrad and the Katishat. They lived in separate quarters and divided responsibility in defending the city from the Bedouins. In 1886, they had tried to keep their autonomy, but Mehmed Rashid Pasha sent troops to demand they open up. This army though consisted of many Bedouins fighting alongside Ottoman troops. While within the province of Jerusalem, some families or tribes did actually begin to fall in line with the Ottomans and make some reforms. Some sold off land and made money and used this money to control other aspects of the economy, like the Abu Ghos family. They had long fought in feudal clashes against their neighbors, but in the 1860s, the Ottomans moved in. The Ottoman soldiers torched many of their villages and power was taken from them, but they then sold off their lands and built mansions to live in. So while dozens fell in power, many more rose up by adapting to the changes, like the Christian El Issa family that I mentioned before. It is also around this time that the Armenians and the Assyrians were being massacred in the east, as part of the Hamadian massacres which I've mentioned before. The Armenian Revolutionary Federation was founded to fight back and bring the atrocities to the world's attention. Like in 1896, they seized the Ottoman bank in the capital. They were seemingly inspired by leftists and somewhat anarchist tactics. This meant they fought guerrilla wars, targeted large institutions, and conducted the odd assassination. After all, in their ranks was Edward Joris, a Belgian anarchist and anti-imperialist. Well, in 1905, they planned on killing the Sultan. They planted explosives in a carriage parked outside a mosque on Friday, knowing that the Sultan was praying inside. However, the bomb was on a timer, and the Sultan began to have a conversation, and his exit was delayed. So when the bomb exploded, dozens of people were killed or injured, but the Sultan survived. Many, including some Turks, celebrated the would-be assassins, as the Sultan had continued to make enemies throughout the empire. Many Arabs, in fact, already feared the Sultan's pro-Turkish policies. Others viewed his rule as authoritarian, and his secret police were repressive. 
while some nationalists saw that he was ruling over a weakening empire. The Sultan, however, from the very beginning, took his role as Caliph more seriously than Sultan. In his words, it was Islam that kept the different groups of the empire like the members of one family. Therefore, the stress should not be on Ottomanism, but on Islam. He therefore challenged the Moroccan's right to claim the title of Caliph, and claimed that all Muslims, whether in British India or Dutch Indonesia, should unite. For instance, he said, India with her millions of population could, if they really wished, easily expel the British, who are sacking and oppressing them. But he also realised that the Muslim Indians lacked any real wealth or power, as the British do nothing except exploit the Indian wealth and power, and treating them like animals. To push forward this pan-Islamist idea, some high-ranking notables from formerly Islamic lands were invited to Istanbul, and many who went on the Hajj were given pamphlets advocating for solidarity in the Caliphate. Then, just as one example, they sent Ali Ghalib Bey to Indonesia in the 1880s. He introduced the idea of praying for the Caliph in Friday prayers. As for Persia, the Sultan wanted them to convert to Sunni Islam, but also he was willing to see the two nations work together regardless. In this way, Persia, in his words, would not be used as a tool of England and Russia. However, in practice, as I mentioned before, when it came to actually acting upon these ambitions, he was often pressured to step down. Like in China, Philippines and Indonesia, where he failed to support his fellow rebellion Muslims. Closer to home, he began to believe that the British were now the greatest threat to the empire, as, although the Russians had taken more lands, he began to think that the British would usurp the title of Caliph and give it to a puppet in Egypt or even in Jeddah. So, to keep the Arab populations on his side, gifts and titles were handed out to notable figures. Plus, the Ottomans did actually have some success in the Arabian Peninsula. There, they were allied with Jabal Shamar in the north. This state had been able to exploit the divisions of the Saudis, and they captured Riyadh, as I mentioned before. Then, the Ottomans would later look to finally build trains to Mecca later on. So, the pan-Islamists had some reasons to be optimistic. However, almost instantly, they began to suffer from reversals again. Like many of the Saudi family were forced to flee to Kuwait, and there, the new ruler had grand ambitions. He was Mubarak al-Sabah, and he took over in 1896 after killing his own brother. However, this fratricide did anger a lot of people. The Ottomans debated sending in troops from Basra, but this was avoided and peace was made. Kuwait, after all, would be a better ally, and would prove vital to the Baghdad railway as a possible port. But Mubarak still didn't trust the Sultan, so in 1899, he signed an alliance with the British. However, as one British official in India wrote, we don't want Kuwait, but we don't want anyone else to have it. Mubarak, though, began developing his grand ambitions of expanding into Arabia. Like in 1901, he decided to launch a huge assault on Najd. There, the Kuwaitis fought against Jabal Shamar, but at the Battle of Sarif, they lost. Mubarak then quickly requested full British protection. Although hesitant, the British decided to sign the status quo agreement with the Ottomans, agreeing that neither side could maintain troops in Kuwait. Mubarak, though, began giving away concessions to the British, including for train lines. Woods challenged the Germans' Berlin-Baghdad Railroad. And he also began smuggling British weapons across the border into the hands of yet another Saudi state. The Saudis were exiled from Riyadh in 1891, and they travelled around the peninsula, sometimes settling in Qatar, or with Mubarak in Kuwait. Well, in 1901, under Ibn Saud, they launched raids. First into Najd, then al Hassa. Finally, in 1902, they made it to Riyadh, and with a tiny force, they actually conquered the city. Forty or so men climbed trees and got over the city walls, and once inside, they killed the governor. Mubarak sent some men to help them hold Riyadh, but still, this was a tiny force at first. Once again, many of the nearby tribes, either through force or due to ideology, joined the new Saudi state, and together they managed to take over most of Najd. Jabal Shamar and the Ottomans sent a force to counter this new threat and halted him in 1904. The fighting would begin a couple of years later, and at the Battle of Wardat Muhana, the Saudis killed the ruler of Jabal Shamar and secured their rule. But growing within this new Saudi state was a force of religious warriors, known as the Ikhwan. They emerged when Wahhabi scholars began their own version of borrowed colonialism, bringing Bedouin into agricultural settlements and teaching them about Salafism. Although this group was small at first, they would grow into a huge force and infamously conduct brutal raids and massacre prisoners. 
All of this was largely at odds with Ibn Saud, who favoured a more diplomatic, almost pragmatic approach to unification. So there was already Kuwait, the Saudis and Jabal Shamar, all vying for control in Arabia. And to make matters even more complicated, there were murmurings of discontent with the Sharif of Mecca. These Sharifs continue to come from the Dawu Awan clan, or at least some sort of relation to them. For centuries they had kept their power by swearing fealty to any larger force, like they swapped to join the Ottomans when they took Mecca from the Mamluks centuries ago. Or in the early 1800s, Abd al muin first fought against the Wahhabis, but then surrendered the city and accepted their authority. Then Muhammad ibn Abd al muin would later be put in power by Muhammad Ali and the Egyptians. They did have some challenges though, like Abd al mutalib who ruled in the middle of the 19th century, opposed Tanzimat reforms and the banning of slavery in particular. So he would be deposed and brought back a couple of times. Also, since the Tanzimat reforms, a new vilayet was created, essentially creating two governments within Hejaz. To make matters worse in the late 19th century, Abdul Hamid began to believe that the British were poised to take over Hejaz, and central to any takeover would be an alliance with the Sharif. These fears were unfounded at this time at least, but in 1880 the Sultan said, by possessing the holy cities of Mecca and Medina, the British could maintain her rule over her vast Muslim population in India. And more and more Indian Muslims were arriving in Mecca, along with many other pilgrims, thanks to the improvement in ships. In 1831, around 112,000 people made the pilgrimage, but by 1910, the number had reached 300,000. This came with problems though, like many Indian arrivals were accused of bringing cholera to the city, especially in 1865 when many died of the disease. And as for the British, they began to suspect that people were being radicalised there. In the words of Richard Francis Burton, who travelled to Mecca himself, This emigration is fraught with evils. It sends forth a horde of malcontents that ripen into bigots. It teaches foreign nations to despise our rule. The Sultan though was convinced of the British threat, and often promoted people from outside the clan, or generally threatened the Sharif's family with a degree of hostility. Like in 1880, Hussein Pasha was assassinated, and his brother was supposed to become the new Sharif of Mecca. But instead the Turks reinstalled Abd al-Mutalab ibn Ghalib, who had been deposed after fighting against the abolition of slavery. However, he belonged to the Zaid clan, and his rule was opposed by the British consul in Jeddah, who described him as a fanatical Wahhabi. He would die just two years later and Hussein's brother finally took over. This was Awin ar rafiq who would rule until 1905, and he had support from the British, who described him as liberal and enlightened. So now you have four regional powers in Arabia, the Sharif of Mecca, Kuwait, the Saudis and Jabal Shamar. Going further south though, Oman had continued on their decline. They had already lost their African colonies, and the country itself was divided between Muscat and Oman proper. In 1870 these two states actually went to war with one another because of complicated local politics. It began when the Saudis had tried to reclaim the Burami oasis from Abu Dhabi. The Sheikh there, Zayed bin Khalifa, requested help and got support from Azan bin Qais, the Imam of Oman. Turkey bin Said, the Sultan of Muscat however refused. Instead he created an alliance with other Emirati rulers, like Hasha bin Maktoum of Dubai. Together they rode out and defeated the Imam at the Battle of Dank, although fighting over the oasis would continue for many more years. Faisal bin Turki would then come to the throne of Muscat in 1888, but he had little control over the tribes. The Hanawi in particular were angry for a number of reasons, like the government could no longer give them subsidies, and the leader believed that the Sultan was planning on removing him from power. Plus, the ruler of Zanzibar, Hamam bin Tawaini, had dreams of reuniting the two states, and he did have a lot more money and a much better army. The Hawaini eventually rebelled in 1895 and sacked Muscat. Faisal managed to survive by paying the rebels off, and fortunately for him, Zanzibar would be defeated by the British in the shortest war in history. But Faisal was far from safe. The royal family were almost seen like foreigners, as many of their ancestors were Ethiopian or Indian. Plus, they relied on the British and gave in to many of their demands, like tobacco and alcohol were sold in the capital, and all religions held equal status. In general, though, Muscat was now more closely tied to British India rather than Arabia. The British never actually really established full legal control in Oman, 
but in 1899 they demonstrated their influence. The Sultan tried to sell railway concessions to the French, but the British ordered that Faisal board a ship and if he didn't, they'd bombard Muscat. Faisal relented to the British demands and stopped the French from gaining the concession. This humiliation was so bad that he asked for permission to abdicate, but George Nathaniel Curzon refused and he was almost forced to rule until 1913. William Lee Warner, the secretary in India, would say of Oman, We are rapidly coming to a crisis in Muscat. How long can we keep the fiction going when the Sultan is afraid to go 10 miles from the capital? And in this climate, many more rebellions would come. Also sticking in Arabia, the Ottomans would essentially lose control of Qatar. They had only really brought it into their empire in 1871 and allowed the Tani family to rule over. But like elsewhere, the peninsula was divided among tribal lines. For instance, in al Ghariya, Jassim bin Muhammad al Tani attacked the Bua Nain tribe in 1885. This tribe appealed for Ottoman support and they got it. The Ottomans then planned on putting Jassim's brother-in-law in power, so Qatar stopped paying taxes to the Turks. However, at that same time, many British Indians were arriving in the region and they began to work in the pearl trading business. Jassim though closed down their shops and drove them out, trying to maintain his independence. However, in 1893, Ottoman troops were sent to Qatar to remove him from power. The Qataris met the invaders and drove them back into al Wajba fort. There, cut off from any source of water, the Ottomans surrendered. Qatar didn't necessarily become an independent state straight away, but they were clearly outside the full control of the empire. Some Ottoman troops even remained in Doha, however, during World War I, Qatar would join the British Empire. The Pan-Islamists were therefore losing land, plus the Pan-Turkists would suffer greater losses, as Central Asia was conquered in the late 19th century. Beginning in the 1870s, the Russians launched a whole new host of campaigns in Central Asia. Like in 1873, they returned to Kiva and this time they were successful. Then in 1876, they destroyed the Kokand Khanate. They would follow up these victories by taking Turkmenistan in 1881 and Merv in 1884, thus killing the dream of a pan-Turkic empire for decades. The Russians quickly set to work on building the Trans-Caspian Railway Line, which of course worried the British. However, the two nations would meet with one another to cement Afghanistan's northern borders. The British though were expanding themselves. They'd already taken over the Sikh Empire and in 1876, they signed a treaty with the Khalat Khanate. But they were still panicked when Russian diplomats arrived, uninvited, in Afghanistan in 1878. In response to this, the British demanded that Sher Ali Khan accept British diplomats, but he wanted to remain entirely neutral and entertain no foreign dignitaries. This wouldn't do for Britain, so they marched into Afghanistan yet again. Sher Ali Khan had managed to make some big reforms. Like he removed rival Baraksai princes from power in the provinces and modernized the army a bit. However, the British easily marched in and chased him to Mazar-e-Sharif where he died. His son, Mohammed Yakub Khan, was then forced to sign a treaty with Britain, turning the country into a protectorate. Plus, he also had to give away towns like Quetta to the British, so they today lay inside of Pakistan. Some of these borders were defined later on, like the Durand Line of 1893. There were also future border negotiations with Persia later on, however, I'll skip a lot of that here. Many Afghans, however, were angry about all this and continued to fight back. In the west, Ayub Khan led forces to victory in the Battle of Maiwand, while in Kabul, the population once again rose up, forcing Muhammad Yaqub to abdicate. Ayub Khan was made the new Shah, but he wouldn't rule for long, as the British this time were able to respond effectively. They crushed Ayub at Kandahar and then appointed Abdur Rahman Khan to be the new ruler. He would go on to sign the treaties establishing the new borders along the Durand Line. However, he maintained his independence as a buffer state between the great powers. Internally, he earned the title of the Dracula Emir for his brutality against different ethnic groups. Many were forcibly transferred around the country while others were just massacred. Like in 1888, the Shia Hazara rose up. The Shah responded by torching towns, massacring people, and like Nadia Shah and Tamerlane beforehand, building towers out of skulls and forcing women into marriages. He was also a remarkably religious leader and wanted to remove foreign religions from the country. So a hundred years before the Taliban completed the job, 
the Emir tried to destroy the Buddhas of Bamiyan. Meanwhile, across the border, Persia, much like Afghanistan, was wedged between the great powers. Here, the people continued to suffer as, in the 1870s, a famine struck the land, the causes of which haven't quite been established. Some say it was a mix of poor administration, corrupt leaders hoarding grain and manipulating the markets. Obviously, added on to this is bad weather, while others say it was because many people left farming to join the more lucrative cotton industries. And even the number of deaths are not known, as they range from anywhere between 200,000 to over 2.5 million. However, in recent years, Iranian historians like Golgi Maj have deemed this to be a Victorian Holocaust, and he will call later famines like that in 1917 again another genocide. Through it all, Nasser al-Din Shah still ruled, and the country continued down the same path, often opposing any reforms. The Shah's vizier, Mirza Yusuf Astiani, prevented the country from making any great changes. While more liberal viziers like Hussein Khan Sepesala were removed from power for granting unpopular concessions, which I'll get onto in a bit. There were some new developments, especially within the army, with the creation of the Persian Cossack Brigade. This would become the most effective fighting force in Persia, however, the troops were trained by Russian officers, and it sort of became a Russian force within Persia. These would in fact become so powerful that later on they would bring down shahs. So really, the country was still weak. Many Islamic leaders were asserting control over different aspects of the state. In the west, the Kurds were attacking, and Arabistan still lay out of the central government's control. Plus, the Bakhtiari tribes were forcibly united by Hussein Ghali Khan Il Khani. Although he largely worked alongside the Shah, he was a warlord, and his son, Ali Khali Khan, would later be influential in later uprisings. Foreigners also began to arrive, looking to gain concessions to extract resources or build train lines. Like Baron Reuter, the man who founded the news agency. He presented a contract to the Shah in 1872, but he tried to take over too much, including most factories and resources. The Shah cancelled the agreement saying it contained the most complete and extraordinary surrender of the entire industrial resources of a kingdom into foreign hands that has probably ever been dreamed of. This was the concession that the liberal vizier Shepesala pressured the Shah to accept, but most of the public and parliament forced the Shah to reject it. However, Persia still needed money to modernize, yet this was highly unlikely under the Shahs. They continued to spend what little money they had on lavish palaces and ceremonies. So, they had no real army, and still depended on loyal tribes. Most of their arable land was still going to waste, and they had huge nomadic populations. Then came in G. F. Talbot in 1890, who took over the tobacco industry. In exchange, the Shah would get an annual payment and a share of the profits, so this seemed like a good deal. However, over 200,000 Persians were already active in the tobacco industry, and across the country people protested. Jamal al-Din al-Afghani even got involved, calling on people to save Persia from this criminal who was offered the provinces of the land of Iran to auction among the great powers. And the Grand Ayatollah declared a fatwa against the use of tobacco. In the end, the Shah was forced to end the concession, but it came at a cost. Their industry never really developed at this time, so they just had to take out loans instead. The Shah also fell in line with the more radical elements of his state, and it created a sort of strange environment within the country, almost unique in a way to Persia. Elsewhere, in the 19th century, liberalism was often tied to free trade and constitutional rule. But when looking at Persia, almost the reverse is true. The autocratic Shah had been looking to open markets and hand out concessions. In response to this, there was a growing movement of people, largely conservative and protectionists, that wanted a constitution to stop him from doing so. Again, this is a gross oversimplification. For instance, Al Afghani was a modernist, but thought that the Shah was selling out the country. So many who objected to free trade and concessions could still be reformers. For his role in the protests, Afghani was forced out of the country and he fled to Istanbul. There he met another exile called Mirza Reza Kermani. There were other Persians here, like Mirza Malcolm Khan, a Christian reformer who had held posts in the government. He created the House of Forgetfulness, which was a Mason-like organization, and their activities worried the Shah. He was also a little corrupt, 
as he sold a lottery concession in Britain, knowing that the Shah would never allow it. Because of this, he was stripped of all of his titles and began writing critical articles about the Shah and in favour of a complete shift in society. This would include land distribution, women's rights, Western institutions and the likes. So the opposition to the Shah was pretty complex and they plotted on killing him. Mirza Reza Kermani travelled back to Persia and shot the Shah in 1896. However, nothing really improved. Mozaffar ad-Din took over and he sold even more concessions to foreigners and took out even more loans. But while the Egyptians, Ottomans and Tunisians took out loans to at least in part develop their country, Mozaffar ad-Din was taking out loans to travel to Europe in luxury. And while his father had been keen on photography, he became somewhat obsessed with cinema. So he lived in luxury in a palace still filled with slaves, as the country would not abolish the trade until much later on. To pay for all this, he began selling concessions to the Europeans, despite the fact his father had faced huge protests against this. In 1901, he gave William Knox Darcy the right to search for oil and exploit whatever he found. He gave even more to the Russians, allowing them to open up mines, build highways and more. Obviously, this would have seen Persia have some sort of infrastructure, but the wealth would largely be extracted from the country. And because of their already existing debts, tariffs were placed on goods, but the money went straight to the Russian bankers. This caused even more resentment and strange alliances would begin to emerge between Islamic scholars and liberals. So most of the Islamic world continued on their decline, but the people were given some sort of hope when the Japanese defeated Russia in war. This was in fact so widely celebrated that people in the Ottoman Empire named their children after Japanese admirals. Also, the rise of the German Empire would provide many with a possible ally, who hoped to escape the clutches of Britain, Russia or France. 